Greetings, everyone. It's, it's just past one. Uh, welcome to the CDC Climate and Health Virtual Symposium and this webinar series. This is the inaugural webinar uh, of, you know, of what we hope would be a continuing series uh, that we would host over the next several months. Uh, you know, this is being organized by the CDC's Climate and Health Program. We had originally planned uh, you know, this as an in-person symposium in March 2020, uh, you know, which had to be postponed. Uh, and so we hope this platform would allow a much broader engagement uh, and we appreciate your participation. Uh, you know, this promises to be a very informative discussion um, on not only the impacts of climate change on public health, but uh, more importantly, what's being done to improve health resilience and reduce the disproportionately high burden that certain communities face. Uh, as many of you would know, Hurricane Zeta swept through parts of the southern and eastern United States, uh, uh, you know, since last evening and, uh, you know, overnight. And uh, we in Atlanta, we, we have witnessed and currently witnessing disruption in power and internet services. Um, and so I hope we go through this webinar without any major disruption. So fingers crossed. Uh, next slide, please. I'll just quickly run through the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, we will start with welcoming remarks from Dr. Eric Svensson, uh, Director of the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice at CDC. Uh, you know, after Dr. Svensson remarks, we will move on to hearing from our four esteemed panelists from the National Academies of Medicine, uh, NAACP, World Health Organization, and CDC. Uh, you know, who will share with us how the respective organizations are leading research and civic en engagement on this issue. Uh, we will then transition into a panel discussion with the panelists, and we welcome you to submit questions through the Q&A box that you see on the Zoom platform. Uh, we will end today's webinar uh, with closing remarks from Dr. Josephine Malayle. Uh, she's the chief of the Asthma and Community Health Branch uh, in which the Climate and Health Program is situated. With that, uh, I will pass it off to Dr. Eric Svensson for his welcoming remarks. Eric, next slide, please. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Shabayu? We can. Thank you. All right. Can we go to the next slide? All right, so uh, Dr. Saha mentioned our structure in our division. So this is just a little bit of a framework to show you where we are within, uh, where the climate and health program is within our division. So you see that at the asthma and community health branch is the branch that hosts our climate and health program. We have the program nested with the asthma program and the air pollution program because there's a lot of overlap and a lot of different issues related to climate and air pollution and, and things like that. Uh, they do work with other units across the entire division and they've been successfully doing so for a very long time. Uh, a most recent uh, successful collaboration was over the summer with the tracking program where they helped to build the climate uh, uh, and health heat tracker with them. And so more to come on that. So they've been uh, engaged across the division, but they are focused within this branch. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of their successes with cross uh, division level collaborations here in a little bit. Next slide. So this is our uh, vision and our mission for our division. And I'd like to really focus in on a couple pieces that are relevant to our discussion today. So uh, within our uh, division, it's really implicit in basically everything that we do, that we're really focused on environmental justice related issues. Uh, and you'll see that in, in some of the language that we have in there in that we're looking to protect all populations and we're looking at et equitable communities, for example. And so this is woven into what we do. It's part of who we are. And it's really exciting to see how we're revamping some of those uh, more focused efforts in environmental justice uh, within our center here uh, in the last few months talking about uh, this new environmental justice strategic planning pro program that's going through right now and seeing where we could do a better job of, of weaving into uh, health equity into what we do as a division, as a center across uh, our part of CDC. All right, next slide. So within the climate and health program, this is the, uh, the vision and, and the strategies here. But as you, you've heard, we were hoping to celebrate the birthday of this, this uh, program. They were 
initiated back in, in 2009 with an appropriation from Congress. And that appropriation has gone up over time and their scope, impact and program has grown over time as well. And so this program is, uh, does a lot of incredible work, not just in how the climate is changing our health, uh, they are also looking at the ways that the harm um, within the world around us, how we can in integrate in, in interventions to help mitigate some of those and how our behaviors, our workforce, our infrastructure, our environment as a whole, how we can uh, adapt to climate and the changes around us so that we can rise above it and be able to protect public health in the midst of the current circumstances. So they have federally funded programs, and you'll hear more about it uh, uh, across the country in helping to uh, mitigate some of those uh, concerns in public health communities and uh, protect public health. And uh, you see that they work through three core strategies, and this is just a simple way to really describe the, way, the work that they do in building the evidence base, which is really the science and, and looking at how to study both how the changing climate is impacting health, but also how they can effectively and equitably adapt to it. So that's the science piece. But then they also want to be able to work on that adaptation issue and, and expand the capacity uh, across all of public health to be able to leverage the uh, existing evidence of what we need to do uh, with the resources to be able to help to make those changes happen. And then tell the story, uh, which means that uh, not, not only are they gonna be getting the best information uh, out about how the climate is impacting our health, but also being able to take the best practices and put them into the hands of those who can make a difference in communities across the country. So uh, one example, uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to showcase here before we move on is, and we were, sh we were shut down back in March because of the uh, COVID crisis and we were all pushed to remote work and we had to cancel this, this incredible symposium. But since then, our folks have been diligently working throughout public health and working in disasters and being able to help prevent the impacts of climate on our populations. And, and so many of the folks within the climate and health program got mobilized into the response and helped provide some guidance for our public health officials to be able to help manage uh, climate related disasters and climate related events, even like a hurricane that we just went through in the context of COVID. And it was incredibly successful. And I just wanted to say congratulations to all of them. You've heard of all the terrible numbers and all the negatives, but you don't hear about the positives and how the work that they've done in helping to provide guidance and how to use cooling shelters in the context of, uh, of COVID-19, how to develop uh, disaster shelters and use them in the context of COVID-19. That's been incredibly successful and thousands and thousands of people have been protected because of those activities. So, so they've been quite busy, even though we've transitioned to a new world and with that, I'll just pass it back to you, uh, Shubayu, and uh, say thank you. And we're looking forward to the discussions today. Thank you so much, Dr. Zensen. Uh, could I get to the next slide, please? Uh, it's my tremendous honor to welcome Dr. Victor Zhao. Uh, Dr. Zhao is the president of the National Academy of Medicine, um, uh, uh, you know, the vice chair of the Natural Research Council, and has a, a remarkably distinguished career in medicine and health innovation. Uh, unfortunately, he will have to leave a bit early due to a last minute scheduling conflict. Uh, and so we'll have, a, uh, have him for a bit longer to, you know, for his opening remarks. Um, you know, and, you know, we, we would hear from the other panelists after that. Uh, so Dr. Victor Zhao, thank you so much. It's oh, thank you. Thank you, Shabai. And it's great to listen to Eric and to be connected with this very exciting uh, activity and this new initiative. I apologize to my fellow panelists and to the audience that I do have to leave early, but I hope that uh, I'll be able to at least address some of the questions that Shabaya posed to me after my uh, initial remarks. Um, can I have first slide, please? I want to tell you, next slide, um, who we are. Many of you may know, but the public may not know, we are 
part of the National Academies complex. We call it National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. And there are three academies, the National Academy of Sciences, the one for engineering, and of course, National Academy of Medicine. These three co-govern the National Research Council, which will produce a lot of effective work. And to a large extent, we're influential voice that shape health and medicine or science engineering through the work that we do in convening and our impactful reports, and of course, through our membership and volunteers. Uh, we have some really most influential members. Uh, like every year, this year we have two Nobel laureates and we continue to engage rapid, uh, extensively with community, with uh, CDC, with uh, all of you. And of course, our job is to work with all of you to see how we can help and advise the nation about the direction of health and medicine. Next slide. So in that regard, <clears throat> I would say to you first how committed we are at the National Academies on the issue of climate change. Uh, the presidents don't usually release a lot of statements. I think as a total this past year, we released about six. This is one of them. That is that we strongly believe that the scientific evidence of climate change exists, should be recognized, built upon, and most important, acted upon for benefit of society. Next slide. And if you look at what we do at National Academy, we have many, many years of work in climate change. If you look at our report proceedings and other consensus study reports, I've only listed a few on top that look at climate change, sustainable community, human health, and well-being of communities in a changing climate. Importantly, we have now created more and more programs that really focus on climate, environment, uh, and others. So you can see that three ongoing interdisciplinary programs that addresses climate, and that we are now developing a concept that will create a climate center across all the three academies to bring them all together. Next slide. But I'm here to tell you about our work in human health, because despite all that work we've done at National Academies, the health side has not been as emphasized as it should be. And here's where we, NAM or National Academy of Medicine, step in and play our role as we play the role of working across all the three academies. This slide is modified from Andrew Haynes and also from CDC, thank you. Which pretty much I give, summarizes what we're talking about, which is with rising levels of carbon dioxide and other climate pollutants, pollutants we have rising temperature, rising sea levels, and extreme weather events as we are now witnessing so frequently. That obviously is impacting and interacting with factors such as demographic, socioeconomic, environment, and others that result in these pathways we see in the middle column, horizontal one that says severe weather, extreme heat, air pollution, water quality impacts, water and food supply, changes in vectors, environmental degradation. What you see in the lower column are the illnesses and health outcomes that are affected by these different pathways. And of course, I need not to tell you about mental health, injuries, fatalities, heat-related illness, cardiovascular disease, asthma and respiratory disease, and infectious disease. Can you go back to last slide, please? Um, particularly as it relates to water quality and change in vector ecology, we're seeing a lot of emergence and re-emergence of infectious disease that we're dealing with. The, the relation between climate and what we see in COVID is very, very clear in my mind. Water supply, food supply, and obviously forced migration, civil conflict, and many other issues. Next slide. Now where the National Academy of Medicine, next slide. Oh, and then of course there are many sectors and systems that impact, are impacted by climate change as we look at human health. The health sector, for example, is responsible for 10% of U.S. carbon emissions and 5% of global emissions. That's substantial, you know, and I'll come back to this issue later. Uh, air, energy costs air pollution, resulting in 7 million premature deaths per year globally. Food and agriculture, the risk from energy intensive diets, 11 million deaths per year. Transportation, another factor, and of course, 
physical inactivity, 5 million premature to death, and so many other sectors. So we recognize in health and medicine, we are interacting with many different sectors, particularly as it relates to climate change. And how do we as a community work with all of you to make a difference? Next slide. So this is where we decided that we should do something about this. At the NAM, we're celebrating our 50 years since the formation of the IOM, Institute of Medicine, which is now called the National Academy of Medicine. And so we went and say in the 50th anniversary, what's a big idea? And we asked for five, and of course climate and health came up as among the top ones. At the same time, our members became extremely interested and engaged this issue. So they formed an interest group in October 2019, which had a packed room of people wanting to work this area. Now it's a formal interest group of the NAM. So we begin to ask around how we should move this agenda forward and started working with the rest of the National Academies and discovered that Burroughs Welcome Fund is interested in this topic. So together with them, we created the first expert planning meeting in December. We got people together that work in the intersection of climate and health. And kind of in many ways gave the foundation thinking of where we need to be. Then we created uh, both NAM and uh, Bill's Welcome Fund put down $300,000 to create these awards for our staff to come up with great ideas across different divisions. And it's been wildly successful. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So because of all that, we formed a strategic planning group that's been meeting since March four or five times to say, if we're going to go forward, what is the big idea and how can we make a difference? And I'm very happy to tell you that in our annual meeting last week, announced that we will take this on as our grand challenge. This will be the second grand challenge in the history of IOM or NAM. So it's a very big deal for us. Next slide. So what is it? Well, our grand challenge has to be scope. It has to be global, but emphasize US because there's so much work to do, but we must be connected globally. We have to think about beyond ourselves to have radical collaboration and partnership. Like people like yourself, you know, the issue of environmental justice, the issue of engineering, the issue of economics, and energy sectors, all those working, in this case, of course, emphasizing human health. So our focus has to be human health because there's a lot of activities already being done everywhere. So we don't want to be diffused. We want to be focused. We have to have sheer, clearly achievable goals and targets. We have to make a difference and we have to be distinctive. That is played to our strength of the NAM. Next slide. So what is it? So the planning group has finished its work, created a concept note, and now it's about, we are about to move to the next stage to implement. They find the three strategic object, uh, objectives. One is given the intersection of so many systems on human health and climate, we have to bring them together to create a roadmap to say how do we work together to move forward, changing practice and policy. Second, Given the fact that we want immediate action, we sense, feel a sense of urgency. We want to work immediately on issues that we can work on, such as transforming our own sector itself. And third, because innovation and movement is so important, we want to create bold interdisciplinary solutions through innovation and transformation. And I'll talk briefly about each one of those. Next slide. So on the first one, it's very clear that individual and population health outcomes are a result of many systems, healthcare, transportation, infrastructure, food, agriculture, housing, energy. They intersect, interact with each other, all affected by climate change and affecting human health. Now, we feel that we have a unique role because after all, what do people care about? They care about the health, their wellness, the economic security, and of course, safety. And if we're able to bring this issue to the public to get more attention, how this is affecting themselves now in their health and not later in other environmental changes, we think we make a difference. But importantly, to our knowledge, there's no organization 
think about the intersection system as it relates to health. So we thought we would design a more equitable climate sustained economy with a health promoting health centric focus. Next slide. So the first thing we're gonna do will be create a roadmap. It's a very extensive roadmap. We've done this before in healthy longevity. We've done this before in pandemics. That is, we bring together multiple sectors and have several work streams, all working to look at how we can improve human health and well being by mitigating, adapting resilience to climate change. Now, let me say a word about this. So, for example, one important issue is. What is the economic impact in improving health and improving the carbon emission or reducing carbon emission in a health model? So as we look at our data to date, the data is very clear that uh, there's tremendous health and economic impact looking at where, what we're practicing today and how we can help tomorrow. Just talking about health alone, and I'll come back to that, the kind of facilities high instruments, et cetera, emits huge amount of carbon and others that not only drives towards expensive healthcare and disease orientation, but in fact also creates a climate change uh, issue. So I want to come back to that. So the roadmap will be US focused, but joint international ideas. We want to shape policy practice in the multiple sect systems together but focus on human health. Next slide. So that leads me to what I was talking about, health sector. We believe that we ourselves in the health sector can do something about it and must do something about it now. So we want to mobilize health professions, healthcare entities, hospitals, CEOs, but also supply chain and everybody in the health industry, including industry, to look at their impact environment. And together we can reduce carbon emission, maybe go towards neutrality in a period of time by bringing everybody together. As I said, there's every reason to do this because as we look at what's happened to COVID, when people started converting to telehealth and reducing the usage of hospitals, not only have we reduced greatly the energy consumption and carbon emission, but also allow us to bring the care to the community. That is what it's all about. So this is an opportunity for us to transform our own sector. Next slide. So what we will be doing is to have multi-sectoral leaders to look at this issue, but to be sure we can't do this alone. We need to bring in engineering and important economists, because as you think about this, in industry, there's in fact a tax credit, but in nonprofit hospitals, there's no such thing. So we want to align incentive to change the way in which incentives are given to healthcare to actually reduce the usage of the high energy producing requiring facilities towards more in community and population health. Uh, and we want to communicate as we should be doing uh, to the public about the importance of climate, mitigating climate change and on the issue of health. Next slide. So this is a report that I showed you earlier of the opportunity grants. One such report is already written by Walt Vernon, Don Berwick, and Eric Burson, where they already have given us an initial map of how we can achieve carbon neutrality for the health sector. There's a lot more work to be done, but we are really eager to take this on, working along with Jerry Cohen and others to enable this to happen, since we can bring in many different sectors together. Next slide. The last area is innovation. We believe that we need new inspiring mechanism, not only to transform the way we do things, but create a movement. We've done that on our first healthy uh, grand challenge for healthy longevity. We just finished first round of uh, competition. Five, 50 countries were involved. We had 1,500 applications of bold ideas of how they can improve healthy longevity and we funded 154 projects. So by thinking along this way, we can create a lot of movement in universities, in healthcare researchers and others to all connect with and improve the area of innovation and climate change and human health. Next slide. So I'll skip that and then go to the last slide 
to say that this is a slide from UR CDC, a really helpful slide, but I just want to emphasize it takes everybody to work together. But in our case, we focus on human health. And this is where we believe our strength is. We work across the national academies with the engineers and the scientists. We will work with all of you today and with other sectors to try to improve human health by, in fact, addressing climate change. So thank you very much for your time. Next slide. Okay. So Shabura said, I send you three questions, if you can address them, uh, and since you can't do the panel discussion. And I would say that the questions are good and excellent. The last one is tough. The first one would be, how does your agency prioritize climate change as a health risk? Well, guess what? I just said that. It is the highest priority that we have identified going forward. It's our grand challenge. It's a five-year, if not longer, multi-year commitment of our organization to mobilize resources, people, to address the things that we want to address. So that is the highest priority ever. The second question is, what role do you see public health in an effort? I think public health is front end and center, particularly in the issue of climate and human health. After all, public health is supposed to protect and prevent uh, you know, and improve health of the population. And when you think about public health in this space, we think about mitigation, we think about adaptation, we think about communication, education. So all that, if you think about this, is what we can do by working with other sectors on mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, after all, we had seat belts that reduce automobile injury and deaths. And there's emission standards for cars. We can do a lot more by looking at air pollution and many other areas. In adaption, as you already heard from Eric, there's a lot you can do, extreme weather events, hurricanes, wildfires, and helping communities to prevent and to respond to these really horrific issues. And education and communication, well, we just talked about how important it is to let the public know about the importance of climate mitigating, adapting to climate change and improving human health, but also encouraging people to walk, to bike, rather than use automobiles. And to do the right practice is so important. The last question is in my field. Well, I'm a cardiovascular person. And <clears throat> when I think about this, I say, wow, I can think about a lot of progress because cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease are on the rise. But there are evidence that intervention can help. For example, during COVID, when there's much less mobility, et cetera, a study in Europe showed that there's 11,000 fewer deaths from air pollution, sharp drops in traffic and industry emission, resulting in 1.3 million fewer days of work absence, 6,000 fewer children develop asthma, 1,900 avoiding emergency room visits, and 6,000 fewer preterm births. Now that's an early study. So I can imagine going forward, this is really impactful. We all remember during the Beijing Olympic Games when they started saying, well, we're gonna curtail traffic to reduce air pollution, to improve the air quality. There again, they saw a significant reduction in cardiovascular disease through reduction in sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen dioxide emission. So I would say, yes, it can happen. We, all, we just need the will and the effort to work together on this. And I'm so glad you invited me because National Academy is ready to work with all of you. We are committed. And thank you so much for including me. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhao, for your, for your leadership. Um, just to remind uh, you know, folks in the audience, please use the Q&A function that you see on the Zoom platform to send in your question yeah, you know, for the panelists. Um, and you know, next, we extend a very warm welcome uh, to Ms. Jacqueline Patterson. Uh, Ms. Patterson is the director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. As a researcher, an advocate, an activist, she leads from the front on women's rights, uh, racial and environmental justice issues. So welcome, Ms. Patterson.
Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you all. And I appreciate the grounding that our the previous panel has provided because many of the what I'll share will be kind of uh, stories that are attached to, to many of the both the challenges and the solutions that we talked about there. So when we talk about the intersection of climate change and health, we know that many of the inequities that we find across the climate continuum are either result from health disparities in terms of exacerbation or they result in health disparities. So whether it's the exposure to pollution on the driver side of the climate continuum to the shifts to agricultural yields, the extreme weather events, and the uh, sea level rise, we see how there are disproportionate impacts on certain populations and certain communities um, and intersecting impacts often for, for those pop at risk populations and communities. We, uh, there was a seminal report put out called Toxic Waste and Race in 1987 and then there was a 20 year anniversary report put out in 2007 and that work continues. It really found that the disproportionate exposure to um, to toxic facilities and practices were being borne by communities of color as, as well as by low income communities. And in the work that we do at the NAACP, we see how that actually plays out in communities. We put out two reports over the last few years called um, Cold Blooded, Putting Profits Before People and Fumes Across the Fence Line, the um, health impacts of, uh, of the oil and gas industry on African-American children. And there we detailed um, stories of families where there was one family who lived uh, two miles away from a coal fire power plant and their grandson wasn't able to go to school like other kids, wasn't able to, um, wasn't able to play outside like other kids because of his extreme asthma. We know that African American children are three to five times more likely to to enter the hospital from an asthma attack and two to three times more likely to die of an asthma attack. And 71% of African American families, according to recent studies, are uh, living in counties in violation of uh, federal air pollution standards. We also know that race, um, even above income, is the number one indicator of whether you're going to be exposed to these, these types of toxic facilities. So we see how, with, whether it's Antoine who's having a hard time paying, and I mean, who's having a hard time going to school because of his asthma or poor air quality days, or it's Crystal, who we met in Kansas City, who um, has a hard time paying attention in school because we know that out of these smokestacks, not only is it um, nitrogen, and nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide, which impacts asthma, but also it's manganese and lead, which is also tied to both um, behavior issues as well as attention issues. And so when we, as the NAACP, do work across the, um, across the, the social justice issues spectrum. We know from our, our studies that if you're um, not on grade level by the third grade, you're more, to, more than likely to enter into the school to prison pipeline. And if a child is having a hard time paying attention to school and not able to go to school um, like other kids, and we also know that if we're near a toxic facility, then on average our um, property values are 15% lower and property values are what finances schools. So also the, the, the quality of education that we're getting from our schools is lower, then we know that um, we're more likely to be on that path to the school and prison pipeline while we see such high statistics in terms of our representation in the criminal justice system. So these are just, that's just one kind of illustrative example of the intersections. And when we look at other um, health disparities, we know that also um, gender is another uh, challenge as it relates to disproportionate impact, whether it is the women who are who are missing and murdered um, along the, and, and also women who are experiencing sexual violence along the pipeline um, path. And we know pipelines are, energy production is one of the major contributors to clim climate change. And we also know that in the, whether it's the man camps where the oil and gas extraction happens, where, where men are gathering to stay at those places away from their families for, for months on end to work those rigs that we see, and in, in particularly in South Dakota, North Dakota, this high proliferation of missing and murdered indigenous women in those, in those situations. So we talk about public health impacts, certainly violence against women is a major one. And as we've seen, we talked earlier about Hurricane Zeta, whether it's Hurricane Katrina, the earthquake in Gujarat, the BP oil joint disaster, and all of these disasters, 
we find a spike in violence against women um, in the aftermath of disaster, both domestic violence because of the heightened stress in, in, a, in, in a household, as well as sexual violence because of the insecurity in post-disaster context. So we also talk about the, and we're uh, staying on gender for a minute, the extreme heat impacts that we're finding in our communities is, um, is, is resulting is, is in um, communities of color, particularly African-American um, and Latin, Latinx communities are more likely to be residing in urban heat islands. And there are growing studies that find the connection between urban heat islands and compromised birth outcomes, which is yet another um, gendered impact. Also, one of the toxins that come out of these smokestacks that are disproportionately located in our communities is um, mercury, which is also known to be an endocrine disruptor. And we know that um, African-American families are more likely to have low birth weight, that we're more likely to experience infant mortality. And we know that there's multiple factors that lead to that, including the environments that we're engaged, we're um, exposed to both in terms of the drivers and the impacts of, of climate change. We. Um, I, I was born and raised in Chicago, and recently I watched the film Cooked that recently came out, which I came out, which I highly recommend. And it talked about the urban heat island impact in Chicago and the the many people who died in the heat wave of 1995. Talked about both kind of the uh, the the housing disparities that resulted in that vulnerability in terms of the quality of housing, as well as the neighborhood disparities that resulted in those in those um, fatalities being um, primary, primarily African American because of the lack of tree cover and so for, and and between lack of tree cover, the lack of uh, ventilation and housing, the lack of air conditioning, all of those were factors. And I thought about how my grandmother um, lived in the neighborhood where there was the highest concentration of fatalities in the context of that. Um, of that she had passed away by then, but I thought, would she have even survived the heat wave um, if she had been there? And so yet another, um, yet another um, uh, uh, set of uh, vulnerabilities that, that, that impact our communities. And I'm staying on neighborhoods and, and how neighborhoods, so we know that, that the way the neighborhoods are constructed and, and, and who has access to resources, whose infrastructure is more challenged is tied to historic and modern day red lines and segregation in our communities and therefore the, the separation from the types of resources that we need, whether it's tree cover or whether it's food. And we, we also know that one of the impacts of climate change is, is uh, shifts in agricultural yields. So already 26% of African-American families are food insecure. And that was before COVID-19. And we know how that's impacting folks across the country and even more so African-American families. And so shifts in agricultural yields are then on top of the existing food insecurity. Um, uh, there is a term that folks use for food insecurity uh, called food deserts, but many of the, the movement for food justice actually doesn't like the term food deserts because it implies something that happens naturally when we all know that um, that between redlining and other kind of neighborhood segregation issues that we have these disproportionate impacts in, um, in certain communities in terms of of um, a separation from food resources. Also, when we, when we look at neighborhoods, um, again, in the context of this, this, these disasters and the storm surge that we're seeing, after Hurricane Katrina, there were, um, seven years after Hurricane Katrina, there was Hurricane Matthew that inundated Louisiana, much like the storm surge is inundating these areas now. And when the Army Corps of Engineers was asked why it was that the levees hadn't been fortified there, um, in Packman's Parish, they said, well, we use a formula to prioritize which levees we are, um, we are fortifying first. And the formula applies points to each levee based on what the economic impact would be if that levee was overtaken. So it's another example, like so many of uh, what's called in this book, weapons of math, M-A-T-H, destruction, weapons of math destruction. We really talked about all these formulas in our society that set up certain communities for and people for disproportionate um, uh, um, inequities, like whether it's protection from in terms of stormwater management, or whether it's um, putting up a um, a sound barrier next to a highway, or it is the um, our the quality of our of our um, educational system, or it's the placement of of, uh, of landfills in our communities because the the um, the uh, sorry uh, property values are lower, so therefore, when people need large uh, um, 
places of parcels of land, then they choose a lower income, um, lower property value communities to do so. So I know I only have about four minutes left. So and I have like 10 other points to make, but I'll just kind of run through them quickly and say, you know, whether it's sea level rise that's displacing our communities, not only fracturing families and communities, but separating um, people from the cultural connection that they have to the land and water, the water scarcity that where uh, communities of color are more likely, uh, low income communities are more likely to have their water shut off, like a, an actual vital, vital resource for life in a world that's two thirds water. We have um, we have the uh, the uh, dr the droughts uh, and dry conditions that are resulting in the California wildfires, and not only kind of harming you know killing um, people and, and and destroying property properties and so forth, but also putting folks who are already vulnerable because of of uh, respiratory illnesses that are more more likely to be in in BIPOC and, and you know black and indigenous and African I mean, Latinx communities, that exacerbating those conditions. Um, we also have a we know there's a connection between disasters and the prison industrial complex in terms of whether it's the prisoners who are who are abandoned after Hurricane Katrina to the prisoners who are used to fight the forest fires but not given the same level of rights in terms of protections and training and therefore they're more likely to suffer injury in the in the context of those um, those conditions. So in my last, uh, I'll just also say that we also need to be thinking about the ways that police brutality shows shows up in these contexts, whether it's the folks who were shot on the Danziger Bridge when they were just trying to find their families in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, or all the ways that people experience um, discrimination when it comes to, to um, provision of services in the aftermath of disasters. And then with all of these things that I've talked about, which are just so many, we have the cascading and cumulative impacts of the compounding challenges that whether it's a women, a people of color, women who are people of color, LGBTQ populations who are discriminated against when it comes to sheltering in the aftermath of disasters, and when it comes to proper health care in, in those contexts, the, certainly the people who are coming into the nation because of needing um, sanctuary and refuge from their nations where their lands have dried up or they've experienced disasters and their homes are no longer have, um, uh, able to be lived in. While the U.S. is 4% of the global population, we're 25% of the emissions that drive climate change. Yet when people come seeking refuge, we separate people from their families and we put children in cages. So these are the kind of contexts that makes us see the social determinants of health and the ways that we need to actually be thinking about, as we talked about before, the, the systems transformation in order to see our ways to the solutions that we need. So with the U.S. history stemming from manifest destiny and the trail of tears to slavery to racism and beyond, we have an economy and a political system and a culture that's predicated on there being winners and losers. Even though we have an ecosystem and a divine that's divinely designed based on principles and practices of regeneration and cooperation, from the cooperative systems of the ant and bee colonies to the fact that seeds have an infinite capacity for regeneration, to the fact that the sun rises every day like clockwork, bringing new opportunities for inner for energy generation around the globe. So we have to really transform our systems and have a political economy that doesn't favor profits over people and corporations over communities, we have to shift from the extractive, exploitive, and oppressive ways that we have our system to one that, to a system that's rooted in regeneration, cooperation, and deep democracy. So concretely, we need to look at policies like reversing Citizens United that, that again favors corporations, advancing campaign finance reform so we don't have a corporatocracy that controls our democracy. Um, it, it, making sure that we have local, strong local economies versus a monopolistic corporatocracy. Making sure that we have universal access to the commons from green space and tree cover to clean air, to energy, to food, to water, to safe products and um, preventative health care services and so much more. But, and we have all of that as a possibility because again, the earth was divine to provide for all of its inhabitants. So I'll just end with two quotes um, to leave us inspired after a little bit of grimness there. Um, one from Gandhi where he says, a thousand candles can be lighted from the flame of one candle and the life of the candle will not be shortened. And the words of Martin Luther King, 
in a, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. He said that all of us are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Patterson, for being so inspirational. Um, next slide, please, Ben. And so I'm glad that our next speaker uh, agreed to join us from across the Atlantic, uh, even though it's quite late in the day for him. Dr. Diamit Campbell Lendrum is the leader of the climate change and health team at the World Health Organization in Geneva. His uh, leadership over the years has really promoted the salience of public health and international climate negotiations and shaped a broader climate and health research agenda. So welcome, Dr. Lendrum. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Shubayo. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to, uh, to join you. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with uh, CDC and the other leading US institutions. You are some of our most valued partners, in, including on this, uh, this issue of climate change and health. Um, and thanks very much to the, the previous uh, speakers for, for really, uh, I think, quite inspirational, not only inspirational, but, but really quite hopeful um, discussions about what we can do to overcome these, these huge challenges that we face. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So this is basically um, my summary of the year 2020 in, in one slide. Uh, where I think we're you know, seeing the, the effect of compounding crises in, in one place. We, we're currently living through the, uh, the COVID crisis, but at the same time, we are, have not escaped from uh, the ongoing um, process of environmental degradation that has been leading to, uh, to climate change, raising a multitude of, of health risks um, that often come together, both you know, with the, the, the climate risks themselves compounding or interacting with the, the other determinants of, um, of health and other health challenges that we face, as I think we particularly heard from the, uh, from the last speaker. Um, it's, it's difficult for me to express just how important an issue this now is for uh, the World Health Organization. Um, WHO published its first report on climate change and health in, in 1990. Um, and over that time, I've been involved in the issue for almost 20 years now. Uh, we've just seen the issue uh, become more and more important, more and more central to the, to, the, to the health discussions and the health agenda. It's moved from being sort of a fringe issue, something that is, is seen as a, a bit of an interesting novelty to something that is, is absolutely at the core now of what WHO does. Um, I think the reason for that is, is quite clear. We're a, a membership organization. We, we represent the 194 uh, countries which are, uh, are members of WHO, and many of them are absolutely threatened with, by climate change as a survival issue. Um, we've just heard about you know, some of the impacts of, of climate change on, on low-lying communities. We have a whole series of countries which are our, um, our, the, the people that we re represent who will literally go underwater within the next few decades if um, climate change is not addressed in a serious manner. So that is a survival issue for them across every, every, every forum that they have, uh, including at the World Health Organization. So when, we, um, when our candidates were running for election for Director General a few years back, every one of them had climate change as, a, uh, as an issue. And our Director General had it as a, one of only four public health issues that, um, that he was committed to, uh, to address environment and climate change. And most of that was climate change. So it's, it's absolutely critical to what we do. And it's, it's fantastic to see the, uh, the US organizations strengthening their, uh, their engagement on this issue as well. Next slide, please. So we see basically um, the, the issue that we're dealing with as, WH, uh, as WHO as two, we, we reckon we have two major tasks uh, for, uh, for WHO and for the public health community at large in addressing climate change. If I could ask you uh, just to, to click through the animations on the slide. Uh, the first is that we know we have to get greenhouse gas emissions down. Um, in order to meet the Paris uh, targets, which basically all countries have signed up to, uh, we're going to have to cut 
carbon emissions soon and fast if we're going to stay within that 1.5 two degree centigrade limit that all countries signed up to in, in 2015. And we are way off that path at the moment. Uh, so we see part of the challenge for public health is to lend our voice to this drive to, down, uh, this drive to drive down carbon emissions and to do so in such a way that it also promotes public health at the same time. So that's task number one on the left. On the right hand side, the other task and the more perhaps the more obvious and immediate one is to protect people from the health risks which are now inevitable because of climate change. So this first um, figure is just uh, it's a figure from the Lancet Countdown, which we're a partner of, which shows the uh, the observed increase in exposure to um, uh, to, to heat stress uh, in over recent years, over the past 20 years or so. Um, that's one challenge and it's one that CDC is, is heavily engaged with. But if you can uh, click through the rest of the, the animation, the big challenge that we have is that this is not like COVID. It is not one disease where we have a range of quite well-defined uh, interventions and then hopefully soon a vaccine, which will, if we roll it out in the right way, will, will eventually take care of the problem. We have a wide range of health impacts uh, which are all affected by climate change. So whether that's uh, extreme weather events, whether that's um, increasing the suitable conditions for transmission of infectious diseases like um, malaria, dengue, so on, uh, to waterborne diseases, to, as I mentioned uh, slightly earlier, um, the challenge of sea level rise, which will, uh, as I say, eventually wash over um, some uh, some whole countries. So, so those are the two the, the two parts of the problem, uh, as we see it. If we can go to the next slide, please. As the previous speaker has <coughs> has made clear, um, climate change is not an equal opportunity threat. Uh, this is. Uh, just by its nature, it has been profoundly uh, inequitable in the way that the problem has arisen and in the way that people are exposed to that. So the, the excellent examples we've just heard are, are, are all of the, the, the ones that occur at the, at the individual uh, level or at the, at the national level with different population groups within a society being affected in, in very different ways. But we can even see that at the largest level, at the, at the international level as well. So the, the graph that is shown here is, is work that, that we were involved with a long time ago now, almost 20 years ago, when we did the first estimates of the, uh, the global burden of disease from climate change. Um, that's the graph, show, the, the, the figure shown at the, uh, on the bottom, where different countries of the world are, are scaled by you know, inflated or, or deflated by the, um, our estimates to the per capita impact of, uh, of climate change uh, from, our, from our estimates at the time. And the top map shows the cumulative emissions of greenhouse uh, gases. Basically, where did this problem come from? Uh, this is not actually to point the finger at the, at the, the populations, including the, the one I live in, which is, has been a major contributor to the problem. This has not been a deliberate act, but we do make this, uh, we do show this mainly to, to urge that there should be some global solidarity here. Um, that by accident, by effectively an accident of history, um, populations have contributed to, to, to global contamination of the global atmosphere, which is raising risks and it's those risks are disproportionately falling on those populations, whether it's within societies, within countries or between countries which have not contributed uh, so much to the problem. So that is part of the, the, the reason why we consider it so important for WHO uh, to engage on this issue and to work with all countries to try and address this. Can we go to the next slide, please? The challenge that we have is, as I mentioned earlier, this is not single disease with single intervention or, or set of interventions. Um, because these challenges are so diverse, we need to strengthen health systems as a whole. So the slide here is basically the WHO equivalent of uh, the one that um, Dr. Zhao showed earlier from CDC, the, uh, the BRACE framework. We talk about the building blocks of, of health systems, which are widely recognized across um, health systems around the world. Most health systems will recognize the function of leadership and governance, health workforce, information systems, uh, financing, um, delivery of, uh, of, of interventions and technologies. And what we have done is to say, well, we need to build climate resilience onto each of those. So the outer ring that we show there is, is how you can build for example, uh, climate informed early warning systems into your information systems, how you can look at your technologies and your infrastructure and 
do what you need to do in order to bring down their environmental footprint and to strengthen their climate resilience. So if you could uh, move on to the next slide, please, or the next animation. And just to, to, to say, we promote this as a systems uh, approach, um, but partly for the purposes of this uh, seminar, but also in reality, when we go to countries, countries will want to focus on, on different parts of this. So it's almost always important to that they will that they will need additional financing. It's always important, and that they will need capacity building um, in order to to strengthen the awareness, the the understanding of the health workforce to deal with this challenge. Most health systems will want better information and the use of increasingly the use of climate to strengthen their surveillance systems, and the particularly concrete uh, intervention, if you if you like, is that most health systems spend most of their resources on on health facilities on or on, actually on delivery whether it's personnel or hard infrastructure so most of them want to know specifically what they can do within their uh, the core of their health system so as i say we build the whole system approach but we um but we will often focus in on specific areas and i'll just focus in on one for the uh, for, for the next couple of slides of this presentation next slide please So just to, to, to highlight that, one of the, uh, the products that we've just launched within the last couple of weeks is uh, specific guidance on climate resilience and environmental sustainability in healthcare facilities. As you've heard earlier in this uh, seminar, um, healthcare is now a, uh, one of the more significant contributors to global greenhouse gas emissions. It's about 5% of emissions uh, globally. So it is critically important that we reduce, we put health systems on a path to a lower environmental footprint. At the same time, in particularly in the poorest parts of, uh, of the world, they have a real problem just with access to basic services, whether that's water and sanitation, whether that's uh, energy access, whether it's knowing what they can do with their healthcare, their healthcare waste. So we've tried to basically bring these two together and say, particularly within uh, low and middle income countries, can we put forward an approach uh, that enables countries to know what to do to, to, to basically either to refit or to build new healthcare facilities, which meet these two objectives of increasing their providing basic services that are also resilient to climate change, but also put them on a, a track to, to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. So I won't uh, go into the details of this, um, but it's just to, uh, to, to say that, the, that this is, these are the, uh, the basic um, objectives. We have that goal of, of, of more resilience and uh, lower impact on the global environment. Um, I'll refer you to the guide, but uh, also in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll move to the next slide, please. And basically the, the overall objective that we have is that we recognize that um, the risk either to a population or to a healthcare facility is a function of the hazard that they're exposed to, whether that's the extreme weather events or some other environmental determinant. It's a function of the degree to which that community or facility is exposed, whether it's in harm's way. And then it's also a function of the vulnerability factors um, that, that determine whether that exposure actually causes risk or harm in, uh, in, uh, over time. And so our objective in, in working with healthcare facilities or populations is always to try and reduce the hazard at source, to cut off the source of exposure and to redu reduce the, uh, the vulnerability in order to reduce risk. Um, and within all of that, we're trying to shrink basically that, um, that, that zone of risk and at the same time to put, um, put facilities or populations on the path to reduced um, environmental uh, impact on, uh, reduced impact on, on the environment. I think the, the good news that we are seeing is that in many cases, it's many of the same interventions are actually good for health, good for resilience and have, a low, have lower emissions as well. Just to give the most obvious example, solar energy has now dropped so much in price. It is now the cheapest energy uh, source in, uh, in the world. And it's very often it's the most uh, suitable energy source for um, remote healthcare facilities. So rather than recommending that these facilities have diesel generators, increasingly it's, it's a viable option to say they should have solar, solar energy, wastewater recycling and so on instead. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the questions that, that was framing this discussion is how do we prioritize and how seriously do, uh, do, do countries and, and agencies around the world take this problem? 
Uh, I think the, the good news, one of the, the hopeful answers to the question, the questions that Shabai was, uh, was posing to all of us, are that there is now quite a high awareness of this issue. Um, if you look at the commitments that countries have made to the Paris uh, Agreement, so again, all countries have signed up to the Paris Agreement, they commit to what they will do on climate change. There is, in fact, a very high coverage of those which will cite health as one of their priorities on acting on climate change. So we are starting to see that confluence of awareness of uh, the, the need to act on climate change, but also the need to protect people's health and the fact that these, these two can go together. So that awareness is starting to come through at the international level. Next slide, please. But there is a difference, uh, I have to say, between political recognition and the commitment that goes in as well. So um, the, on the left-hand side of this, uh, you see basically that, that same picture that I've just shown, particularly in, in low and middle income countries, there's a high level of awareness on uh, the need to, for, for climate change and for health to, to intersect, for policies to be joined up on this issue. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see an example of the, the failing of, uh, of follow-through on that commitment. Um, at the moment, there is a significant amount of money which is put into international multilateral climate finance. Um, although almost all countries say that health is a priority, al almost no finance flows from climate finance into health protection. Almost all of it goes elsewhere. So we still have quite a lot of work to do in joining up these mechanisms of, of the climate mechanisms with the health mechanisms of prioritization. But, I, but I, I have to say, I do see positive progress on that area. I think that is now starting to change. Next slide, please. Um, as uh, Dr. Zhao said uh, earlier, um, health cannot deal with this problem on its own. We know, um, in, in all modesty within the health sector, the most important decisions that affect health are actually decisions which are taken outside of the health sector, whether that's ensuring water and sanitation, whether that's food systems, whether that's the how clean the energy is that we're, the, that we're using to power our society. So it is important for us to make these connections. And we see real differences in, 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 in the, the degree of connection between health and um, other sectors. So this is a survey that we carried out um, last year. We reported the results um, of the degree to which the health sector makes, has formal agreements with other sectors around the world to address climate change and health. The, the bottom line on this is that we see real alignment um, between sectors which have a common interest and in but they don't compete. We particularly particularly the sectors like water and sanitation, we see less direct collaboration with, uh, with other sectors where there is often a perceived conflict of interest uh, between the provision of, of, of energy, what may, may seem to be the cheapest energy source, which may be a polluting energy source, and health impacts. In many cases, that's, that's it. that is a question of perception, it's not the reality. Um, but we, uh, I think we do have to be conscious that we have to work very hard uh, to look out, to reach outside of our, our, our normal sphere of influence and, and to work with other sectors which have these important determinants of health. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, um, as the previous uh, speaker uh, concluded with some sort of hopeful remarks, there are many positive arguments for climate action. Uh, we do not, we don't see ourselves in the business of only trying to scare people into acting on climate change, important though that is, and, and true though that is, that we need to act on the climate crisis. There are very many immediate positive gains of, uh, of acting on climate. Next slide, please. The, the, the first of these is um, because of the massive overlap between actions that are good for climate and good for health. So the last slide showed the highly polluted you, I think we, we've already heard that, that air pollution is one of the largest determinants of health now. Um, air pollution kills about 7 million people uh, around the year. It's as big as any other uh, uh, risk factor that we have uh, around the world. And about, at least for outdoor air pollution, about two thirds of that exposure is from burning fossil fuels. So if countries or around the world were able to take the actions that they need to take to meet the Paris Agreement, in fact, the, the benefits for health, um, which would be in the region of at least a million lives saved a year if we met the Paris targets, if you were to put an economic valuation of that on those, those health gains are about twice as large as what it would cost us to fix climate change. So we should no longer be talking about the cost of fixing climate change at the global level is how fast can we get the health, economic and climate benefits of cleaner energy. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and this really ought to figure into all of our economic uh, thinking. Um, if we were to, uh, at the moment, the polluting energy around the world effectively receives about a $5 trillion subsidy because the, the impacts of polluting energy sources are not in, incorporated into the cost of the product. Uh, and in many cases, there is direct financial subsidy to polluting energy. If we were to put a price on carbon, uh, which was just in line with the impacts that that, that, that has on, uh, on societies around the world, in fact, we would immediately have a massive impact on air pollution, a significant impact on carbon emissions, and also generate uh, revenues that could be invested in more uh, socially sustainable um, activities. Uh, we say that the, the, the the energy, that health is effectively at least half of the energy story. Um, if you value the health implications of energy decisions, then, then almost uh, always the health, that health valuation dominates. It's one of, it's, it's about half of the, of the valuation and it always pushes in, in, in the direction of cleaner energy sources. Next slide, please. So uh, coming to the end now, I, the, I think the, the, the final message um, that I have, I think is the, I'm, uh, by the confluence between our approach to this issue and the the approach that we saw at the beginning of, of, of CDC, we, we are, we're all about building the evidence base, we're all about expanding capacity, but we're all, all about telling the story as well. And the point I wanted to make here is that the health community has a massive role to play in telling this story. Uh, the slide that is shown here, these are, are figures from the UK on trust in different professions around the world. Um, hopefully you can read them and hopefully those of you who work in the, the health sector will, will see that the health, health professionals are effectively the single most trusted profession in the world. And the degree to which they speak up on, uh, on climate change and the benefits that can come to health from acting on climate change, um, they will have a, a disproportionate influence in affecting public opinion in a positive direction. So we really do need to step up to this challenge. And the final uh, slide that I have, if we can move, move on please, is uh, just to give a, a very few examples of, of areas where this is already happening. Uh, as we heard earlier on, there is this now this grand challenge, which is a fantastic thing on, on effectively transforming health systems. In other parts of the world, that is starting to happen. Um, so the National Health Service in, in England, which is the largest single health service in the world, just last month, just this month, in fact, committed to become carbon neutral by its 100th birthday, so that's sometime during the 2040s. So they have, and they will have to think about how to transform their system in order to do that. Um, WHO now we're obviously very highly focused on, on COVID, but we published a few months ago a manifesto for a healthy recovery from COVID, which talks about all the ways in which um, actions to the, the investment packages which are going now into recovering from the COVID crisis can also be beneficial for action on climate and also promote health. We'll also see even you know, demonstrators on the streets, the, you know, the young people who are taking to the streets to act to demonstrate on climate change are making that connection to, to health as well. And finally, by, by way of advertisement, um, on the 9th of November, we uh, will be kicking off um, on behalf of the UK Climate Presidency, um, a, the Race to Zero Dialogues, which are uh, basically setting the agenda for the run up to the next uh, climate change convention. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, pass you back to Shubhaya. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, David. Uh, it, that was a wonderful uh, uh, you know, talk. Uh, it's, it's my honor to introduce our final panelist. Uh, Dr. Patrick Bricey is the director of the National Center for Environmental Health and the Agency for Toxic Substance and Dege uh, Disease Registry at CDC. Uh, he leads CDC's efforts to investigate the relationship between environmental factors and health. And under Dr. Bricey's leadership, uh, the, you know, the climate and health program continues to grow and cover more ground as we help uh, more and more local health departments to better prepare for climate change. Thank you, Dr. Bricey. Just can I have my first slide, please. I want to start by thanking my fellow panelists for being here today to share their perspectives, and I look forward to participating on the panel. And I hope that this webinar contributes to the broader conversation about how we can better work collaboratively across all levels of governments sectors and organizations to address climate health changes and challenges. As, as the director of the National Center for Environmental Health and ATSDR, uh, today I'll focus my thoughts on climate and health as they relate to environmental public health. As I said before, 
Uh, and I'll say it again, climate change represents the biggest environmental health challenge of our time. The impact of climate change on human health is growing concern, as we've heard, and it's a key priority for us here at the National Center for Environmental Health and HSDR. I know that many of us are constantly balancing competing priorities, and it can be challenging to prioritize climate and health among other programs and other emerging issues. There is a tension between short and medium and long-term response, but ultimately we are all working to help communities to be more prepared and resilient to face these challenges, whether today or due to a changing climate in the future. Through our climate and health program and the partnerships that we have, we're building resilient communities that are prepared to effectively respond to a range of hazards and emergency events, which is especially relevant today as we all work to manage our global outbreak of COVID and those of us on the East Coast are struggling with the aftermath of Hurricane Zeta. And you see a, a quote, I think, that captures a lot of the thinking that we have uh, on this one slide from the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change. An unprecedented challenge demands an unprecedented response. And it will take the work of 7.5 billion people currently alive to ensure that the health of a child born today is not defined by a changing climate. So this is a big mandate, this is a big challenge, and that's the focus of what we're talking about today. Can I have the next slide, please? So we've already seen uh, a little bit of information like this, and, and I don't need to go through it again, but just emphasize that climate change impacts, as we know, a wide range of health outcomes. And, and this diagram, which is a graphic that we use as part of our climate health program, illustrates you know, that rising temperatures, extreme weather, rising sea levels, increasing carbon dioxide levels can all lead to a wide range of health aspects. And it's very, I think, important today that the climate debate and, and I think it's appropriate that it shifted to emphasize the impact on health, not just the environmental impacts going forward. So these health changes, I think, are what's going to drive public opinion and what's going to emphasize uh, the importance of going forward. So we need a broad, we need to be aware of the broad potential for climate changing impacts of health over time. We need to communicate this effectively. We need to be particularly conscious of how the different facets can interact with each other and feed into each other over time. So it's a complex situation, complex problem. And this isn't just an environmental health problem. There are many aspects of human health and community health that will be affected by changing climate from mental health to chronic disease. We have to worry about social determinants of disease when we talk about climate, climate changes. We have to worry about where people live, their housing, what other social constructs they have, what other, uh, what other vulnerabilities they have going forward. We in environmental health are at the front lines of this work, but it will take a collaboration from all public health communities of practice and partners and other sectors to protect communities from harmful effects of climate change. Can I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, the impacts of climate change can have significant impl implications on health equity. Climate change disproportionately affects some people and communities, including communities of color, older adults, children, and low income communities. This is the focus of the CDC Climate and Health Program, and we're focusing on equity and vulnerable populations. And we just highlight that in this slide. Uh, if I, we look at one health equity focused document we produce, the assessment, assessing health vulnerability to climate change. You see that on the graphic on the left of this slide. This provides guidance on how health departments can create maps to identify communities that will be disproportionately affected by climate change. The two images on the right depict the spatial distribution of, of six factors affecting vulnerability to extreme heat as an example. These include poverty, elderly living alone, renal disease, impervious surfaces, historic heat exposure, hospital insufficiency. When we map these things, we can see that darker colors indicate areas of higher vulnerability. These maps are important because they allow localities to maximize resources by focusing on areas that will see the greatest impact. The public health approach, which is centered on vulnerability and prioritizing high risk populations, provides an engagement opportunity for many sectors where equity is a shared concern. Next slide, please. Some of this has already been touched on by, by Dr. Svensson in his talk this morning, but the climate health work we do in the climate health program crosses a number of programs within the Center for Environmental Health and ATSDR. And, and since these are be covered, I won't spend a lot of time except for mention just you know, maybe hazardous waste sites is, is an example of something that we don't really think about in this regard. But we, we know that materials are released from hazardous waste sites. They go into the water, they go into the air. 
Anything that affects airborne releases or affects the water hydrology can affect populations' exposure to contaminants might be released to the water, either because of water scarcity and drought conditions, which might concentrate contaminants, or flooding or water, you know, increases where there's, there's too much water because they can spread contaminants around through flooding uh, or other scenarios. Can I have the next slide, please? So it's also important to recognize that within the Center for Disease Control, there's a wide range of activities that touch on climate and health. And it's important for us in our program to interact with these programs at CDC. We now have an opportunity to address new topic areas by leveraging the work across CDC for mutually benefit impacts. Coordination and sharing of subject matter expertise enables us to undertake new innovative projects, engage new stakeholders, and advance CDC's mission of fully integrating climate considerations into activities across the agency. A couple of examples. So for example, we work with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, on work-related ambient heat exposures in a variety of southern states. In 2016, CDC launched a new national reporting system for harmful algal blooms called the One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System, OHHABS, because when you work for the government, you have to abbreviate everything. The OHHABS is a CDC collaboration, but also interacts with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and includes input from multiple public health departments and other federal agencies. The new surveillance system is a long result of a collaboration between the National Center for Environmental Health and the National Center for Emerging Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, one of the other centers in CDC, along with, as I said, other public health partners. So by working across CDC, we can magnify our impact. Next slide, please. In addition, success truly depends on effective class sector collaboration and partnerships. To facilitate these relationships in 2019, we released a product on cross-sector collaboration. This document, this guidance document outlines ways health professionals can collaborate with 10 different sectors on the climate and health topics. The sector range, the sectors included a range from transportation to agricultural health care. Again, recognizing as others have mentioned that, that climate affects uh, the entire economic system and the business system and, and across the country. As public health professional, common opportunities for engagement include the opportunity to add credible, credibility and trusted authority to community health, to support the advancement of health equity, as I mentioned before, to build upon existing sector relationships and adaptation efforts that are already underway. Many of our national public health partners are championing cross-sector efforts around climate and health for the American Academy of Pediatrics to the American Planning Association. The Environmental Health Coalition which we work with through the American Public Health Association, brings together key national public health organizations and has recently formed a climate and health work group, providing an opportunity to actively coordinate around this issue as well. So these cross-sector collaborations are also key to success. Well, we're excited about these efforts and I'm proud of the work that we've done at the Climate and Health Program and we're happy to be celebrating our 10th anniversary. Uh, it's important that we continue to reflect on on these important relationships and how do we build on them. As this work impacts, as I said, nearly every sector, it's critical that we bring all the players to the table and that we are participating in efforts with other sectors and, and that are leading to address this issue. We must move past our comfort zones, and in this case, working with agencies and, and groups we're not familiar with in order to make this work. Next slide, please. So we could spend hours talking about the challenges, but I'll just touch on a few challenges. Uh, so we know that there are different time scales that are, that are impacted by climate and health and building resilience and adaptation plans that deal with these for time scales represents a challenge going forward. We wanna make sure we deal with immediate effects, but we also have to think long-term and balancing these time scales represents a challenge. We know that there's a range of uncertainty on complicated topics like vector-borne diseases, and that uncertainty is something we have to address when we develop our plans as we go forward. And as I mentioned before, developing the complex collaborations across sectors is a challenge. People need to learn more about how to work better together, more effectively. Next slide. Our building resilience against climate effects framework or the BRACE framework 
has already been discussed. And I think this is an important framework for developing ad adaptation plans and activities across the country. So through our research that we provide to state and local health departments, we're implementing the BRACE framework where we work to anticipate climate impacts, we protect their disease burden, we assess a variety of public health interventions, we develop and implement climate ad adaptation plans, and most importantly, we evaluate the impact of those plans, and when those plans are effectively evaluated and show to work, we then use them to, um, to implement programs that we can expand across the country. Next slide, please. So with that, I'll just wrap up and make sure we save some time for discussion and question and answer. So again, thank you for this opportunity today, and I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Bryce. Uh, we, we'll jump into the panel discussion questions. We have a few questions coming in from the audience. Uh, you know, this one is, uh, you know, you know all, all three of you could answer this, but, you know, maybe we'll start with, uh, you know, Jackie. Uh, so the question is, climate change has become uh, politicized for better or for worse. Have you found that there is a difference in your work's impact when you lead messaging around health versus messaging around climate change? Yes. Definitely. Um, health, including just kind of kitchen table issues, like leading with, you know, uh, impacts of disasters, leading with, you know, the things, access to water, leading with pollution. So leading with things that people, that, that people can relate to, that people are seeing every day versus kind of what can be a, a relatively abstract con concept. Although increasingly folks are seeing that that, that things are very different and um, in terms of the, the weather and, and so forth. So increasingly, there is more of a conversation around climate specifically, but definitely leading with health and other actual impacts that people see and feel has been more um, both politically and, and for, in terms of political will for people um, in communities as well as for decision makers as well. Thank you. Dr. Bracey, uh, Dr. Campbell, would you, would you like to? So, so I don't know if it's, if it's more politically challenging, but I think by talking about the health side of things, I think as, as we just heard from Jacqueline, it's, it's, a, it's, it's easier to get people's attention to talk about health because it affects them directly. And so I think it's an effective argument to make. It's not the only argument to make, but I think it's a great place to start. And anything that we can do to help move the needle in terms of public opinion, can only help us all. And so we find that's an effective anchor from which to begin discussion. Dr. Landrum? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, I think the, the evidence is, is actually quite clear. Um, this has been trialed that if that one of the ways in which you reduce polarization around the issue is to frame it around what is a vision for a positive future. Um, and health is always part of that. So if you're talking about um, you know, cleaner in, in environments, better jobs for people, uh, cleaner air, uh, more safe access to water. That is something which unites across almost any political divide. So, so that's that's one of the big um, you know, uh, positives that we we have from the from the health side. I do have to say that the, the level of polarization in, in most parts of the world is is somewhat lower around climate change. Um, that it it is not such a divisive issue, and that, in fact, there are solid majorities now for climate action, basically in every country in the world. Thank you, Dr. Landrum. Uh, you know, next we have an interesting question. It's 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 directed to Dr. Bricey, but you know, others should feel free to respond as well. Uh, you know, the, you know, the question is around uh, you know the potential opportunity that you see in CDC developing uh, massive advocacy or education campaigns on climate and health, similar to what's happened with tobacco campaigns. So oh, um, I think that's a great question. You know, campaigns like that require resources. Uh, and, and right now we're using our resources to what we think is the best effect, and that is through getting monies out to state and local health departments to help them build their, uh, implement the BRACE framework and build their adaptation plans going forward. Uh, but certainly we consider being more aggressive on the risk communication front in the future. Jackie, would you like to comment on that? Please, no. <laughs> but thank you. I mean, yeah. That's okay. Thank you. There's another question for Diamit. Uh, if I could sort of scroll through. Anyway, 
anyways, as you know, I, I'll look for it. Uh, you know, the uh, you know the other question was, you know, as the intersect of climate and social justice had been has been made apparent in today's discussions. Uh, you know, what are some actions that you see would be critical addressing these dual crises? Jackie, if we could start with you. Sorry, so I'm, I was trying to so social. So could you repeat the question? And I also I'm like looking for it in the Q and A to read it as well. As the, as the intersect of climate and social justice has been made apparent in today's discussions, uh, what are some actions that you see as critical to addressing these dual crises? Okay, addressing these dual crises. Okay. Yeah, um, right. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So, so the, the work we do, we always are focusing on multi-solving models, so that we are. So, for example, as we work to address. Uh, Clean, uh, food, local food issues, we work on, we, we do it in a way that creates jobs. As we do it, as we work on, on addressing, uh, we were doing work around advancing a clean energy economy and we, um, we were doing a solar installation and prioritized doing it on a, a domestic violence transitional housing um, place. And we actually trained the women who were, who were survivors of domestic violence uh, as to do solar installations. And now two years later, they're all employed in the solar industry. And they're now a part of the, the clean energy revolution. They also have now have the financial wherewithal to be independent of their abusers. And we, um, and it's also um, freed up resources for the transitional housing place where they were living to apply better resources to their prevention and treatment efforts. So it was a multi-solving approach at, at addressing all a, a number of social justice issues. And then as I was talking before, really dealing with root causes um, is, is critical as well. And that automatically is multi-solving. So the, 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 what I was saying before in terms of campaign finance reform and reversing Citizens United, really making this a more democratic society will solve for climate change because people do care about those issues we talked about, whether it's health or, or, or um, other issues. And they really do have a vision um, for what they want for their future, which is one that is free of pollution and free of the negative impacts of climate change. So really uh, working on restoring a democracy works across a number of issues as well. So thank you. So we have, uh, you know, just a few minutes left for the webinar. Um, you know, thank you so much for, you know, those panel discussions. Hope, uh, you know, I wish we had a few more hours to, to, to go through all the questions that we, that we got through the chat. But uh, I would just, uh, you know, want to, uh, you know, welcome Dr. Josephine Malayle for some closing remarks. Dr. Malayle is the chief of the Asman Community Health Branch, uh, you know, which we are a part of. And uh, I, I would like to uh, welcome Josephine. Josephine, thanks. Can you hear us, Josephine? We can't. We we don't have audio from you. Hello. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah, better. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Shuayu, and good afternoon. We thank our panelists for their very excellent presentations and to the audience for a very thoughtful and engaging discussion. We hope we had more time for uh, for questions. But as you know, we're um, this closes at three to. 30 and not three o'clock as we thought. Um, as you might know, this inaugural webinar celebrates our 10th anniversary, um, which was originally intended to be an in-person event last spring. But we plan additional webinars over the next several months to include the impacts of climate change on multiple disease domains and health risks. And looking at the range of multidisciplinary research that we have accomplished with multi-agency collaborations as we translate science into practice with particular attention to implementing climate and health adaptation at the local level through our climate and health programs, Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative, or CRSCI. Over the past decade, we partnered successfully with state, city, and county health departments and with professional interest groups and NGOs to bring brave and climate-related health issues to the forefront of the public health agenda. 
With increased scientific knowledge and practice, we modify brace as our engagements expanded to working with groups such as tribes and territories with different needs and resources. A collaborative project with the CDC and Kresge Foundations examined the needs to increase climate health readiness in communities with a specific focus on climate equity and, and justice issues. So building on groundwork pioneered by the previous CRSCI grantees, our activities continue with short and long-term adaptation actions that resonate and work effectively for the public, particularly among communities with high risks of exposures and vulnerable to adverse health effects of climate change. A new competitive funding opportunity has been forecasted in grants.gov. Um, the presenters uh, showed a wide range of challenges that we certainly will take to heart. Um, among them are institutional transformation, um, looking at pricing carbon and relating those directly to health, and, um, and innovation, which we strive to implement in all that we do, um, especially here at CDC. So thank you for those ideas. You've certainly um, infused some excitement and interest from the program and the branch. And finally, we invite you to view an upcoming video of the Climate and Health exhibit featured at the CDC Museum that was supposed to have been a part of this celebration. And um, the video will be posted soon on our Climate and Health Programs website. So please stay tuned for that. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Josephine. And, uh, you know, that brings us to the end of the webinar today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Pam, uh, you know, on the screen, you can see the web page for the CDC's Climate and Health Program. Uh, you know, I strongly encourage you to, you know, come and take a look for information on recent publications, uh, climate and health communication material that we have developed, and, uh, you know, a list of accomplishments, uh, you know, specifically from partners in local health departments that we work very closely with. Uh, we will be in touch with you as we uh, form our plans for the next uh, webinars, which will happen sometime early in, uh, early next year. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you everyone for your participation and uh, please uh, stay safe and take care. Hi, Pam.